naming things. I'm going to start with a poem called Longhouse Autumn. I got my first job at the university, when I got my first job at the university in 2003, I lived for a few months in half of a rented longhouse, one of those old Welsh buildings where people and animals used to share the same living space. Mm. Cleaner was still in Cardiff trying to sell our house and we, got, we used to get together at the weekends. Meanwhile, I was living for the first time in my life in the country, about 10 miles south of here in Pansen Pride, and this poem is about that experience. It's quite long, so I'm only going to read the first part. Longhouse Autumn. An attic room stuffed with heat. I write at the window. House flies fizz out of the decaying frame one every few seconds, as if they're breeding there. Outside is a thicket of apple trees, a japonica, roses the orange of a one-bar fire, a smear of sea beyond. They built their houses long here. I live in half of one, a whitewashed slump of stone in the crook of a lane. When I stand outside on my forecourt of cobbles, the village feels Mediterranean, dry as a gecko, and crumbly as the unearthed fragments of some terracotta civilization. The hedge is stippled with blackberries, an anthracite harvest too rich even for the pigeons to finish. The semolina and jam of their droppings spatters the road between strip fields spiked with rusty farm machinery. It leads to a church weatherproofed with slate and tending its flock of gravestones. I walk on the low cliffs doorsteps of sand and pebbles above the pick and mix shingle of the beach, my path strewn with flotsam, flotation pods of seaweed, crab shells, the fanned out spin drift of plastic bottles, and nesting in the bushes, a leathery mummified dogfish. I share the evenings with someone else's furniture, balancing on the brink of an armchair to warm myself at the rose of my one bar fire that cowers in a baronial hearth its chimney rising straight to the night sky. Peer up it, and a star peers back. I read, adrift in my double bed. Seaweed green wallpaper lurks around the perimeter of the lamplight. When I switch off the day, the dark comes up to my face, and I hear its weight pressing on timbers and bed springs. The village floats off through the night. I must swim to catch up with it. This is a poem I wrote for the poet John Varney, who's a great nature lover and writer about nature. I thought I'd write him a poem about a large pond, or mere, as they still call them in the north of England, and the wildlife it supports, right down to the microscopic level, the hydra and the amoeba. There's a mere in the centre of the town of Allsager in Cheshire, where I lived as a child, so I based it on that. Mere, for John Varney. Today, the mere turns a blind eye to the white overhead, but when the wind gets up, it shivers in its sequence. There is blue in the bands around the stem of the dragonfly, a few tatters of sunlight in the flowers of the yellow flag. A heron mimes a pond ornament in the shallows as a mallard takes off from its runway of splashes. The air above the bulrushes is granular with midges. On the surface, a pond skater Pilots, a flotilla of dimples. Metallic swivelling of roaches is no guide. Following those arrows will get you nowhere. There's a green finer than we can see, the hydra budding its offspring. Another mere lapse within the cell wall of the amoeba. This one is about the legendary hot summer of 1976, when I was 19. One of the less reported consequences of the unusual heat was a plague of ladybirds. Ladybird summer. That summer, there was a plague of ladybirds drifting over the garden in a reddish smoke. We'd find them on the carpet, a smattering of coral beads from a broken necklace, but self-willed, crawling every which way, mating like tiddlywinks. The flowering season for insects. Crickets twitched the grass, moths trundled under their paper-dark wings, or crouched on the ceiling in the circle of brighter light above the lampshade, and the mosquitoes balanced on the wall on moonlander legs. Trees split in the heat. We drove through a tawny country, now turned to outback. 
in the pub courtyard. We talked till the colour drained from the petunias in the hanging baskets, unwilling to go home, carrying the weight of the day's air. There was too much summer. The ladybirds that gathered on ledges to be crunched by the closing windows had lost their picture book brightness. We were glad of the first sign of autumn, a bowl of plums, frost blooming on their skin, and tart sunshine in their yellow flesh. I was asked to write a poem about the human ear. As, as poets get asked <laughs> these kind of things sometimes. <laughs> and I remember the old wives' tale that earwigs are supposed to climb inside your ear and wiggle about there. In fact, that's how they got their name. They have a lot of other names too in English and Scottish dialect, names like Arrowwiggle and Horny Gollock. And I tried to get as many of these into the poem as I could. Also, technical words about insect anatomy and the anatomy of the ear. So don't worry if you don't understand it all. It's meant to be like a kind of incantation. Uh, the meaning should be obvious. The way to get the earwig out of your ear is apparently to lure it out with the smell of roasted apple. <laughs> a charm for earwigs. Witchy beetle, forkin' robin, no one heard you as you clambered up the nursery slopes of pillow, felt your way in heaving darkness where a dreamer breathed siroccos, scaled the north face of an earlobe, stumbled on the anti-helix where the cartilage was ruckled into an upended mismaze, teetered round its corrugations to the vortex where the tragus overhung a blood-warm grotto. There was curl room in the concha, but the scent of earwax drew you through a straight and oozy burrow, thrumming with a distant heartbeat. First the walls were soft, then bony, then antennae scratched a membrane. Arrowwiggle, horny gollock, you awoke me from my stupor, rasping with a chitin stylus on my mind, long playing vinyl, ratcheting my taut tympanum with your cacophonic tarsi, set my ossicles percussing with the clangor of rough music, dustbins, copper saucepans, kettles. Now I smear a linen poultice with the pulp of roasted apple, press it wincing on my pinna. Malic steam pervades my chambers to entice you with a perfume sweeter than November compost. Clip shears, Codgy bell, twitch bollock, lift your bristles from my eardrum, <laughs> let the sea of cochlea settle, turn back from the labyrinth. Mm. <laughs> this is a nostalgic poem about a typewriter. One day you'll fetch the Smith Corona from the cupboard, set it on the desk and unclasp its blue plastic shell to expose the nakedness of its baby grand workings. Remember the punch and peck words had in those days, the strain of cue in the little finger, the type head leaning out on its stalk from its semicircular roost, the angelus ting that marked the end of a line, the slap of the silver lever that jerked time forward, the shift key that tilted the world on its fulcrum, the grey formalities hedged by tabs and margins that turned language into geometry, the braille of the other side of the page under the fingertips. What was struck here could never be unstruck, in spite of backspacing and X's, packets of Tipex paper and the vial of snowpake, its screw cap gritted shut. Not used to taking ourselves so seriously, we prodded at the ampersand tangled in its nest, the curly brackets aiming their bows in different directions. Switch on the angle poise lamp. Outside the window, it's carbon paper dark. There's ribbon smudge on your fingers and a new sheet of fool's cap rolled onto the platen. I love word play. And one day I was looking at the word moon and noticed that the O's in it looked like the full moon. So I got the idea of writing a poem in which I only used the vowel O. I spent days writing lists of words that had no other vowel except O and the result was this poem. This is the last poem I'm going to read this half, and then I'll hand over to Krina. Monomoon. O, oh, Rococo clock, crown of fool's gold, stook of corn, clown's pom-pom, ghost's cowl, owl's down hood. Go soft on woods, wolds, moors, rocks, nod, 
to crops, cows, shorn flocks. Throw off spools of floss, whirls of cotton wool blossom. Oh, crocodile.